This episode, we're going to be talking about physical injuries and how it's connected to mental health. Now, I know if you're listening to this, you have probably had some type of physical injury. I know that's just the way life goes, doesn't it? But we're going to talk about with my special guest today, his name is Dr. Derek Price, and we're going to really learn really his fascinating journey of how he went from being in the NFL to where he is now as the CEO of Sierra Tucson Treatment Center. I want to welcome you to the Mental Health Today show. My name is John Cordray, and I am a licensed therapist and the host of the show. And I want to welcome Derek Price, Dr. Derek Price. He is a chiropractor, but he's also a former NFL player. And now currently he is the CEO of Sierra Tucson Treatment Center. And I can't wait to talk about this. All right, Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to hearing about your your story. You, you were you 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 have years of being a, a chiropractor. You have a former life, if you will, of being in the NFL. That's that's an incredible story in and of itself. You were with the Detroit Lions. And now you are the CEO of a very large treatment center. How did all of that happen? Tell us the story, if you will. You know, it it's it almost has to be told in a story because it's like um like life Jenga of how did these random pieces come together? You know, it's it's not too often that uh an athlete becomes a physician, although that does happen, but then you know, a, a chiropractic physician and then end up going into the behavioral health space, and then in the behavioral health space, you know, have the honor of um being the chief executive officer at somewhere like a Sierra Tucson, which is you know, a world renowned facility. So it is an interesting journey. So <laughs> I'm, I'm probably going to have to take you down the road of like, how did we get there? And then I think you'll see how it all patches together. Well, please do. And, and I want to yep. mention too, if you're, li- you might be listening to this episode and maybe you're in the car or maybe you're on a walk or whatever. Uh, but I want to encourage you to go over to my YouTube channel because you'll be able to see behind Derek. He's got his jerseys. From from when he's in the football uh, in in the NFL, so I want you to see that. So if you're if you're listening to this, go head over to my YouTube channel and watch it because it's really interesting. All right, sorry to interrupt you. I, I just had to say that. Hey, I appreciate <laughs> the plug, man. It, it, it makes me feel like I was an athlete still, and I was I'm still important back in the day. But um, so John, the story is is I kind of have to go back to the beginning and kind of set the foundation. So. Um, and I promise to the listeners, it'll be somewhat interesting. So take it all the way back to, you know, childhood, right? Because we all kind of develop in our childhood and we become, you know, what we see and what we do and what's around us. And in my childhood, uh, I was in the mom was there, but dad passed away and I was the old, oldest son. So by age seven, um, I was trying to help out, right? I was trying to be the man of the house. And, and, and the point of that is basically like, I, I, I figured out that if I wanted something like nobody was going to bring it to me or give it to me. So it was very much like a go and get it. And I very much learned early on that the work you put in yields the fruit that you eat. So um, I had a paper route in the third grade. I kind of came up that way. And ultimately, by the time it was time for me to go to college or the thought of going to college, I had the conversation with my mom and was and we didn't have any money. Uh, she was a school teacher and had a bunch of boys in the house. And it was, um, hey, mom, like, what does college look like for me? And, you know, like, is there a fund? You know, I have these friends and their their parents are paying and they're going to these schools. And this is amazing. And she kind of looked at me and she's like, don't you remember last year when I asked you, do you want heat or Christmas present? Like, there's not a college fund here. So um, I actually had some mentors, the coaches that were like, hey, listen, you have enough talent that if you really drill down, you know, we could probably find you a scholarship somewhere. Not at a big school. I was I was average. I was decent. I was lucky to be there, an average guy. And so I put my went went fully into it and just immersed myself. And I get a little OCD about like things I like. I really like them, uh, and I really wanted this to happen. So I went as hard as I could, and I ended up getting a, a small football scholarship to a local junior college. And at the junior college, I realized if I worked really really hard then I could potentially get a a four-year scholarship from the junior college. Uh, And as the universe would have it and as life would have it, you know, the football season went very well for me and I got all the awards and all the All-American stuff and I was able to pick and choose. And now, so I choose the University of Iowa. And I go out to University of Iowa and 
I'm pursuing my degree primarily, and football was secondary to me. Football was my means to an end. It was my job. It was my ability to afford getting the degree. Education was instilled from my mother being a school teacher very early. So my, my finish line was education. And so I finished my senior year of football. And, um, you know, the, the NFL scouts had come through and, and I had said, no, no, thanks. You know, this is, this is a means to an end for me. Like, I'm just here to get my degree paid for. I, I like football, but at the time I didn't love football. Um, and so I kind of declined all the combines and declined all of the invites and to run for pros and to get scouted, and et cetera. And then I went home. And then this is one of those moments in life that, you know, I wonder what the trajectory is if it doesn't happen. I get a phone call from one of a previous coach, a guys named Chuck Long. Chuck Long was the Heisman runner up to Bo Jackson. Hmm. And Chuck Long was a coach of mine. And he calls me on the phone and I'm, 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 I've graduated University of Iowa and I'm back home in Arizona. And I'm filling out applications to go work at Xerox or something. Didn't even know what to do, right? And he calls me up and he says, hey, Derek, listen, um, you're good enough to play at the next level. I really think that you're going to regret it, you know, down the road if you don't take a shot. He goes, just do me a favor. My conscience will be cleared. If you just go run for some pros, just take a shot. If it doesn't work out, like it's a clean, clean break for you. But if you don't do it, you may always look back and regret. And that was a great life lesson. So, you know, I respect my coaches. I respect my, my mentors. So, okay, I'll do that. I moved back to Iowa and I really focus on training and run for the pros, et cetera. And, um, you know, draft day comes and I go to Detroit Lions as an undrafted free agent. I wasn't eligible to be drafted. Didn't fill out the paperwork. But I go to Detroit Lions and I'm as shocked as everybody else is. And so I get there and I'm one of, you know, the 50 people they bring in. They start with 100 and they ultimately cut down to 52 people. And I was one of the people that they brought in. And I'm like, you know, I'm just going to work as hard as I can and leave nothing on the table and no regrets. So I do. And uh, we're getting down, we're getting closer and we're getting closer to that final cut day. And I'm seeing different roommates leave and <laughs> the hallways are getting emptier and, and every morning. And you don't know, talk about like psyops for some of your like what makes professional athletes weird and lunatics is like every morning you hear knocks in the hallway. And if that knock hits your door, you don't have a job or a career anymore. Oh, and you can hear the knocking coming down the hallway and you're like, please pass over my door. Wow. You know, as a matter of fact, on the last day of cuts, um, I got up and left the hotel where we were staying at about 5 a.m. So they couldn't find me. And I just spent the whole day at the mall. This was, you know, I'm going to date myself. This was before cell phones. Uh, and social media. So I spent the whole day at the mall and I was like, if they're going to cut me, they have to find me. So sounded like a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> I go back home and go to sleep. And the next day I know that practice was scheduled for like eight in the morning, but I don't know if I'm cut. I don't know if I made the team, but nobody got a hold of me. So I show up for practice and I kind of very meekly, you know, walk into the, the <laughs> locker room and I look around the corner and my gear is still in my locker. And so I, sheepishly put it on and I go out to the practice field and nobody says anything. And it was like two days of that to where I realized like, well, nobody's said anything to me and my name is still on boards here. So I must've made the team. So dream come true. Boom. I'm in the NFL. And you know, um, when luck meets preparation opportunities right there and the guys in front of me, uh, get hurt. And all of a sudden I'm thrust into the starting lineup. And as an undrafted free agent, I'm my first game that I starts against green Bay which is against Reggie White. And he's <laughs> such a massive human being. If you remember who that human being was that I used to think um, when they would call plays, we're all supposed to block him. I was like, I wonder if the coaches are just trying to punk me and they <laughs> are just laughing. But uh, so I, I go through my season and things are going very, very well. I'm getting a lot of playing time, not just on special teams. And um, we get down to about four games left in the season. I'm running down on a kickoff and I put my head into this giant human being and my body goes to the right, my head goes to the left and my neck just explodes. Mm. So I break my neck. And, and this is an important point. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody because I knew I was so close to the threshold of not being able to live that dream. I wasn't the Barry Sanders. I wasn't the the Troy Aikman I wasn't the Tom Brady I was one of the many 
named Derek Price, who is replaceable by a thousand athletes in, in one phone call. I was a lucky to be their guy. And, and my ego allows for that now. And I knew that if I brought them any information about the fact that I was damaged goods or that I had anything wrong, that that, that was a potential that my career goes away. So I end up self-medicating and playing through the next four games, which t brings us to the end of the season. And every time somebody touched my head or I breathe deep or turn my head, I get lightning bolts, like legitimate lightning bolts shooting up and down my spine, out to my fingers. By the end of the season, I can't feel my hand. And uh, we finished the last game at the 49ers and we're on the plane flying home. Season's over and they walk by the, my chair in the airplane. This is the team doctors. And they say, hey, is there anything that we need to look at? you know, to close out the season? Um, or are you healthy? And if so, you can just go back to Arizona. And I know that we're going to work up our next contract. You had a great year. We're excited to bring you back. So put yourself in that role for just a mm. second. If I go see the doctor, I'll get the treatment that I need, knowing that I'm injured, but there's no chance of a contract. If I pretend it doesn't exist and continue to self-medicate and hide it and don't raise my hand and ask for help, I get to live this life a little bit longer. That's the pro athlete conundrum that, we're, that we all, why don't they raise their hand and say they have a problem? I'm like, because as soon as you're a broke horse, you're a horse with a broke leg, you ain't running anymore. So I go home, my body continues to deteriorate and I sign a contract, right? So it was great. And I come back out what's called an OTA, which is before the season starts, you do these practice sessions. And I walk into the to Detroit head office and I'm 270 pound, muscled up, you know, tight end with a 19 inch right arm and an 11 inch left arm. The, the nerves had been completely crushed going into my tricep and forearm and shoulder. And the lack of innervation uh, shut off the supply to the muscles. I couldn't use them. So they just sat there and twitched and, and moved and my arm just complete atrophy. So basically, as soon as I walked in, they were like, what is wrong with you? And Boom, right off to emergency surgery and so on. And the, the, the surgeon's another one of those sentences that happened to me where the surgeon, while he's looking at me, says to me, hey, based on the curvature of your neck, if you'd have gone to a chiropractor, you probably wouldn't be in my office right now. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And I actually said this. Yeah, right, doc. What are they going to put chicken blood on my earlobes and put a crystal on my forehead? Like, ha ha, thinking we're on this anti-chiropractic because I'd always been pro-medical and I didn't know anything about it. It was witchcraft or whatever. And this, he's a world-class doctor and I won't, I won't name him right here because I haven't talked to him about it, but he looks me in the eye and he's like, that's a very naive statement. And he turns and just walks out of the room. And like, I can tell you what he was wearing. I can tell you the cologne I had on that day. I can tell you where I was sitting, the office number. Like it was that profound of a sentence of, of me trying to like ban, oh yeah, yeah, I wouldn't do that, doc. I'm here for you. And him letting me know how naive I was and, and how ignorant I was that ultimately they do a big surgery. I have a bunch of plates and screws in here. And for all intents and purposes, I go back to Detroit and they're like, hey, you can never play this game again. Uh, we shake hands and, and we go in different directions. And that's kind of what leads me to now I'm saying, well, what am I going to do with my life? And this guy said chiropractic, and I don't even know what that is. And so that's where I started that exploration. And I'll pause for a second, John, because I can go on and on and on, man. Yeah. But I know that this is a two-way conversation. So Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. No, what a what a fascinating journey and story of how you didn't even really want to necessarily be a professional athlete, but here you were on uh, front and center. I mean, you were thrusted on the front lines, literally. Yeah. Yeah. And you were excited to, wow, I guess everybody was right and I was wrong. And now I'm on stage in the, the world stage here in football. And, and then it happens. You, you, you injure yourself. And that's definitely something that you weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. And then it happened. And I think that happens so often with so many people, things happen unexpectedly and it changes. It really literally can change the course of our life. And that's exactly what happened with you. And yeah, in multiple that, occasions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So your story continues with that. And, and I think that is, that's your fear that you had. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm injured but I need to get help. 
but I, if I say I need to get help, then that's, I'm going to, my career is over. My dream is Absolutely. over. And so Absolutely. you were weighing the difference there. What do I do? And I would imagine during that time as well, we were talking about mental health. What was some of the emotions? Do you remember what some of the emotions that you were oh, feeling at fear. that time? Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. the, the pain, the pain was um, unsubsiding, um, constant. I couldn't escape it. Uh, nerve pain, for anybody who's had nerve pain or spinal nerve mm -hmm. pain, um, it's as if you're hooked up to an electric wire that goes down your spine that just burns hot. And it, there just is no escape. It becomes, um, you become a little neurotic. You're like, I can't get mm -hmm. away. Yeah. There's not a position I can find to offload yeah. this, this pain. And to, and it sounds so silly um, in retrospect. Why would you not go get help for that? Like it, it makes no logical sense. And the, the best way I can come to grips with that is obviously what I've already said. But if you think about a high level athlete, and I wouldn't, I don't want to put myself in high level athlete status because I think it's it's a little ego over the top. But let, let's pretend that I was a decent enough athlete. From the time that you're this big. The world's telling you how great you are and how great you are is solely reliant on the fact that you can catch a football better than everybody else, run faster and jump higher. And everywhere you go, you're applauded. And everywhere you go, people don't charge you for things. And as a matter of fact, when you walk into an NFL stadium, that's where you work. Just like John, you work somewhere. I work mm -hmm. somewhere now. Mm -hmm. But you know what's different is I had 100,000 people get on their feet and clap for me every time I went to work. I don't have anybody clapping for me when I come to work now. Mixed with the fact that the culture of combat sports, wrestling, boxing, football, lacrosse, a lot of those sports, and maybe it's changing now, is don't tell me about your problems. Rub some dirt on it. There's no crying in baseball. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody wants to hear about your pain. So if you take 15 years of being applauded for the image of who the world thinks you are, which is an athlete, and that's where you find your positive reinforcement. And they're building your character off of never admit weakness or defeat. And then you stick into my dream is predicated on staying on this field. And this is my livelihood. Like you have a lot of very sharp variables that are very much going against the hand ever going up and saying, I have a problem, mm -hmm. um, which I think is obvious on the injury front, but on the mental health side, imagine this. And we're, I'll take a small segue. We can get back to the story. But I've had so many friends that once the NFL ends for most people, it ends unwilling to the person. Like when I ended, career-ending injury, you don't get to play this game anymore, Derek. This is a hard door. No matter how hard you work or who you ask or what you do, you do not get to play this game anymore. We love you, but this is the end of the road. Boom. I pivot. And within you're going to see within six months later, I'm in, in chiropractic school. The vast majority of my friends aged out, timed out, became too expensive. Something happened. Um, hey, the defensive end got hurt and we have to cut to 52. We want to keep that person. So we're going to cut a receiver over here to make room. You were the receiver that got cut. Once you're off that train and the train being on the actual team, you're still friends with everybody that's on the train. You still take the phone. They, they answer, but they're on a whole different that fraternity is running down the tracks at a thousand miles an hour. And, and, and I see that very much in similarity with like my VA and my military um, patients that I have here at the hospital mm -hmm. or my first responders, LEO paramedics, people that come from that tight fraternity, the locker room fraternity, the brotherhood, like these are the guys that I, I bled with, with, and I, I've, I've sweat with and like broken down with, they've seen me at my worst and they built me up to my strongest. And then all of a sudden that tribe is gone. Yeah. So then you take the athlete that that tribe is gone. You're in isolation. You're living with your own pain and your own emotion. You've been told never to say anything or raise your hand. So you further isolate to hide mm -hmm. your pain. And that's what leads to a lot of the stuff that we sadly read about overdose, suicides, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to be a part of the mission of opening up the world. And, and I think we can tell athletes, raise your hand, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to work. Right. It's not going to work. If you have told me that, I've been like, yeah, sounds good. When you have my job, I'll give you that advice. Mm -hmm. um, we need to go back to the coaching and, and how coaches are talking to junior athletes and allowing them to have space 
to hold space and talk about problems, etc. And not to be like, never tell me your problem. And if you do, you're weak. And if you're weak, you don't play for me, right? And, and John, that'll be, as we discussed pre-show, that's that's part three of our podcast. <laughs> that's right. that talk. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I, so, I appreciate you bringing that stigma out because I think for the vast majority of people, me included, uh, we're not a part of the professional athlete world. And you had a very public because it, you were on TV, you know, people watched you and wow, there, there's Derek Price, right? And we don't realize the amount of pressure that has on an athlete. And in what you were mentioning, like, I can't let anyone know. I can't let anyone know that I need help, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain. Uh, I've, I've have, uh, had uh, over the years, I've had professional athletes as clients and they come in and, and uh, it's that same, gosh, I'm coming to you because I can't let anyone else know uh, because I, it'll affect my profession. You know, if people know if this, if my coach knows or the scout knows, or if my fans know that I'm getting mental health help, then there goes my career. And so it's an added layer that you mentioned isolation and there's depression involved, there's shame involved. And those are the things we don't see. It's those are the behind the scenes, shut the door, you're in your home and you're watching the football game, for instance, and you're, you're not on that team anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. And that's a stigma that uh, I think a lot of us don't realize. So I appreciate you bringing that to light. Yeah, John, imagine, if you will, um, you are famous enough to where uh, you're a hero. You're seen as a hero. Kids have pictures of you, like you're on video game covers, whatever. Your, your poster is in somebody's bedroom as like, that's my idol. And the game ends for you and you find yourself at the bottom of a jar of pills. Mm -hmm. Or you find yourself at the bottom of a, a, an empty bottle. And you know, as soon as you raise your hand and admit that you need help for addiction, the world doesn't see you as a Super Bowl hero anymore. The world doesn't see you as an MVP. You're an addict. You're a junkie, mm. right? And it's gross. And those words are hugely derogatory. Um, and sadly, they're the words that I would have used prior to getting into this field. And, and I'd like to cover that later on in the story. But um, And there is real fear to that. Like, the world knew me as this. And if I come out and say, oh, I'm, I can't stop drinking and I have all these problems, well, that poster is going to come down because you're going to see me different now. And I don't want to lose that because that was the best part of me. So I'm glad there are people like you that are licensed therapists to solve for problems like that because I wouldn't know where to start. Right? It's, and, it, and it's an issue. And with uh, college getting NIL money now, I think you're going to see that the anxiety and the stress. Basically, we just made college sports pro sports. Yeah. Uh, we have kids not going to the pros because they make more money in college than they'll make in the pros right now. Um, I sadly had a neighbor who chose which school he was going to play for based on who could guarantee him the highest pay rate, not wow. what his best chance to play, not what, what's my major I'm pursuing, but like what, how much money can you guarantee me? And, um, and we're in the wild west of it right now. And it's a whole nother, it's podcast five. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, so, there's another episode. No. Sorry, John. <laughs> no, so no, it, no, no, no. You're you're exactly yeah. right, and and that's just going to trickle down and uh, to those young college students, and that's a lot. That's yeah. a lot for a grown adult, let alone a young adult who's still in college. And it's a lot of pressure. Can you imagine if I gave you two million dollars a year at seventeen, yeah. eighteen years old. Yeah. And, yeah exactly. and what right. would you do with it? Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. You're making more than every coach and every faculty member yeah. at that school. Yeah. Like. Well, we'll, see, we'll see, I guess we'll see what happens, right? Yeah. We'll see what happens. Yeah, right. That, that, that is very yeah. true. But I think it's important to be talking about this and Absolutely. the importance of mental health in sports, whether it's professional sports, college sports, or even high school. I think it starts with high school yeah. that uh, coaches totally agree. have a responsibility, I think, that we need to talk about mental health in sports because I think that's so <laughs> neglected for the most part. And that uh, that you know, so a student doesn't become 
a professional athlete in, a, in your situation where you felt like you got hurt, you needed to get help, but you felt like you couldn't say that because you didn't want to uh, ruin your career. And right. you felt like there was something wrong with you, I'm sure. So, all right. So let's pick back up on the story. Okay. Uh, you mentioned, okay, so you, uh, you're no longer with the NFL. Uh, you got your surgery. You got all the, uh, you're basically the bionic man with all the, the metal parts in your neck. Metal parts. parts. Yeah. yeah. And then, then you said you went into chiropractic school, became That's a right. chiropractor. So tell me a little bit about that. So I, I, um, I had graduated from Iowa. I go back and do some of the pre-med stuff. I, you know, I get into chiropractic school and uh, I'm able to do my four years in chiropractic school and graduate and come out. And so I come out and I immediately want to work with athletes. So I'm, I'm, I'm building clinics and uh, I get very excited about what I do. So I start to, to build and, and build more clinics and train more people. And then I started realizing, well, I keep sending all these people to physical therapy. So I bring that in-house. Well, I'm, they're sending to ortho. So I bring that in-house and pain. So by the end of it, uh, by about 16, 17 years into the profession, um, I had amassed multiple clinics across the full spectrum of musculoskeletal care from orthopedic pain management, chiropractic, uh, the MRIs, the, the, every, all, all of it, all, all in. And I got to that place in life where I said, um, hey, I won. I get, to, I get to exit. I get to remove myself from this and, and sell my shares, and, and I'm going to go play golf the rest of my life. And that lasts for about a month. And then the boredom that comes along with not having a purpose um, became very real. And it's one of those conversations that people say all the time, like, oh, you have to have purpose and it gives you drive. And without purpose, you have no, no mission. Without a mission, you know, like you, you feel worthless. And everybody says, well, I'd like the opportunity to get to that. I can tell you that for me, it was very, very real. And so I knew I was good in the leadership space. Um, and I wanted to kind of work for myself at the time. So I go into leadership consulting. And as the universe would have it, Michael Cartwright, the owner of American Addiction Centers at the time, calls me up and says, can I talk to you? And I says, sure. So I fly up to Las Vegas. He said, I have a hospital and I'd like to take a look at it. The nurses won't talk to the doctors and case managers thinks admissions out to get them and admissions won't speak with the residential therapists. And the ther you know the deal. Mm -hmm. And everybody listening to this that's in the industry understands what I'm talking about. Very toxic. And I said, yeah, I think I can fix it. And we start talking. And he says, hey, how about, how, about you just, how about you just come up and be the CEO of this hospital? <laughs> I understand what you've done in medicine. I know your track record. Um, it's just medicine by a different, you know, by a different letter. The CPT is different. The ICD-10s are different. But all in all, it's still the practice of taking care of humans. And I said, well, I'm up for a challenge. Let's, let's do it. Well, let me tell you what the challenge looked like. The challenge was at the end of 2019 that I went into a company that was going through rifts and uh, stock delisting, uh, ultimately bankruptcy and layoffs. And like just a little cherry on top, this thing, COVID comes along <laughs> and says like, hey, we're going to, to figure out how to do this thing by like shut your doors, open your doors, six feet, uh, quarantine for 10 days in a residential program after they arrive, before you even treat them on your dime. And like all of these. It was a while. It was crazy. We, and we all lived through it. It was crazy times. Um, and I don't hold anybody responsible for it because like nobody knew. We didn't uh -huh. know. We didn't yeah. know what this was. But I really cut my teeth and cut them strong. And uh, so I stay up there for, you know, the better part of uh, a little over three years. And um, I get the opportunity to come to Sierra Tucson. And that's ultimately what brought me here. And the premise being like Sierra Tucson affords me a much larger platform. It, it, which is my passion point, which what I realized going back to when I started at Desert Hope was I lived in the stigma that exists. I believed that if you were depressed, I should just tell you to smile. Mm -hmm. Think happy thoughts. I believed that if you were an addict, that was a self-driven disease. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, no, cancer is a disease because that person doesn't, or diabetes is a disease. That person doesn't get to wake up and not have diabetes tomorrow. You can stop drinking right now. You're inflicting this on yourself and therefore almost a zero uh, empathy, right? I had a zero empathy to it. And this is me in practice and all of the hundreds of providers that I employed or worked with or partnered with 
And it's the whole side of the fence over there. And it's not out of malice. It's out of no understanding, right? Like the musculoskeletal side of the house, myself included, seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of patients and having gone through multiple accounts of patients going through a traumatic injury, be it a motor vehicle accident, falling off a ladder, getting speared in football, whatever come in and they're clearly, to what I know now, expressing signs of severe PTS, uh, anxiety, depression, you know, uh, emotional and trauma, like the, the potential addiction, and me pushing all that to the side during the conversation, because A, I didn't know what to do with it, B, it didn't make sense to me, to go to the one thing that I could bill for, that I was, I'm a chiropractor, I'm a bone and joint and muscle doctor, you're here, you walked in the door for shoulder pain from an accident. I know that in that accident, like your wife is still in the hospital, your daughter's in a coma, you, t you have severe PTSD, which I know now, and anxiety and depression and all fear and all this other stuff. And you would start to tell me this and sweat and you're reliving it. And I would literally look at you and say, oh yeah, so yeah, okay. Well, um, so how's that shoulder? Like, give me one out of 10 on the shoulder today and let's look at range of motion. I'd move right past it. Mm -hmm. And and that bothers me viscerally. And it bothers me viscerally to this day because those were patients that entrusted their health care in me. And at the time, I gave them everything I knew, but I, I didn't know. So that's, that's my why. That's my mission that we'll get to. And, um, you know, I have, a, I have a project. I would call it a pet project, but it's, a, it's my life project right now. Is, and here's numbers for you. For those of you guys that are like actuaries and number people, like, I think you'll appreciate this. I want to bring chiropractors into mental health. Mm. How? I do not want them to treat any aspect of mental health. It's not in their purview. It's not in their licensure. It's not in their training. But let me run numbers for you. There's 70, and this is all Googleable. There's 70,000 <laughs> licensed chiropractors in the United States right now with 10,000 students in school right now. There's 35 million unique office visits to chiropractors last year in the United States. 50% of patients going to a chiropractor are treated for what we call chronic pain. Chronic pain, as definition by Medicare Medicaid, is eight or more days. So it's not mm. you've had it for 10 years. And this same pain, unrelenting for eight or more days, becomes chronic. So if I know that of the 35 million unique office visits and about 50%, but to use easy numbers, we'll just say 16 million, half of that, are coming in with chronic pain. And I know from the American Psychiatric Association that 35 to 45% of people would suffer chronic pain have a diagnosable mental health condition, mm -hmm. i.e. most namely depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. Then I look back and I say, so you're telling me that in the chiropractic side of the house right now, they have about 8 million people that go through a year, seven to 8 million patients going through a year, that are going undiagnosed, untreated, and undiscussed about just mental health. And it's just chiropractic. I haven't talked about physical therapy, physiatry, pain management, orthopedics, any, any of the other body work, musculoskeletal providers, just talking about chiropractors. And so what my mission is right now is to build a proprietary screening, GAD7, PHQ9, PTS, and not in its totality. It'd be, it'd be overwhelming, but proprietary, little asterisks, not for diagnostic value to be able to deliver to these guys and say, hey, I know you don't know what to do with it. But in the litigious society we live in right now, if somebody brings it up, you better handle it because you're a doctor. And when they tell you something, you own it, you have to be responsible for it. You don't have to treat it, but you're responsible. So I want to get this to you so that you can score your patients and anybody over like very simple, five out of 10, it elicits a call to somebody. And who's that somebody? What are, like rising tides float all boats. Listen, I want this to roll out in Kentucky. So you're two sons in Tucson. I'm not getting anybody from Kentucky. But I want, I want the chiropractors to have the ability and the understanding that I didn't have to push out more people for mental health. And I think when we do that and when the musculoskeletal community gets on board with what mental health is and isn't, and ultimately how to deal with it, which is here's your off ramp so you don't have to own the liability, so you don't have to just ignore it. I think the stigma starts to go away because of white coat power. When mm. you have the doctors that you're seeing talking to you about, like, I'd like you to go do this, stigma starts to reduce. Mm -hmm. When we just pretend it doesn't exist, stigma lives. Yeah. Now, we're talking about oceans and ponds. 
And in no disrespect to our licensed professional counselors, psychiatrists, or psychologists, but run the math on how many of us there are on, in this pool. And run the math on how many people are marketing to this pool to fill residential facilities and MAP programs and everything else. Now let's go look at this thing called the vast ocean where about 19 out of 20 office visits are going to happen in the United States today, which is Cairo PT, family practice, ortho, pain management, physiatry. Why don't we start fishing out of that ocean and just all we have to do is create the lure. Mm -hmm. Hey, you don't need to understand the whole thing, doc, but here's the screening tool. And when it pops positive, here's the off ramp. Send it to so-and-so in your neighborhood. So my big ask and my big platform on, on uh, specifically to this podcast, and I have no financial or fiduciary win here because it's not going through the Derek Price Foundation, <laughs> is please go break bread with the musculoskeletal providers in your area. They do not know what you know and what you know and take for granted because it's so fingertip to you and seems so obvious just doesn't exist there. Mm. Go enlighten them, show them the path. They want the pathway to take care of their patients. They are doctors. They're empathetic, just like everybody that's listening to this is. They don't know the road. And when you don't know the road, what do you do? You avoid. Mm -hmm. And so that's my big passion project. And so what's very cool is I'm actually working with some university presidents at some of the larger chiropractic schools that I won't out right now because it's not formalized. <laughs> and we're going to start embedding it into the curriculum of the education and train these 10,000 mm. students in chiropractic school how to screen it and what it is and what it isn't. But in, in absolute clarity, not to treat it, not to infringe upon the licensed professionals that would be listening to this, psychiatry and psychologists. Listen, this is your world. Mm. But wouldn't you love to have more people looking for applicable patients for you to save? And if you truly believe this is life-saving work, and I truly believe it's life-saving work, then <clears throat> Do we have a duty? I believe we have a duty. I think we have a purpose. I think we have a calling. Now, you can see why I get fired up about things like <laughs> I'm a bull in a china shop. So if I went too hard in the paint right there, John, I apologize. But this is, it's, we need to save more people. And there's ways to do it. And let's go do it. Absolutely. I love it. I think that is an amazing uh, mission and passion that, that you just shared. And I know, I, I write with you, I believe that licensed therapists can rub shoulders and work hand in hand with chiropractors. And if we were to do that, think about how many people could actually, when we work together, we're not separate when we work together and, and, uh, and be able to say, okay, you, you, this is your profession this is what you do. And you see a lot of people who are hurting, uh, physically. And then you got these licensed therapists who see a lot of people who are hurting emotionally. Wow. Yeah, you had the physical and the emotional, and they often, like you pointed out, go together. That's yeah, amazing. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Thank well, you. excellent. Uh, so, <clears throat> thank you for sharing that that vision and and that mission and passion about uh, chiropractic and mental health. And I think that's so important. But I know the story. Your story is not over yet. So, so you went from chiropractic, and now you're the CEO of um, Sierra Tucson. Tell us a little bit about that. Who is it for? What do yeah, you sure. do? Just tell us a little bit more about that. Sure, sure. <clears throat> so Sierra Tucson, we're down in obviously Tucson, Arizona. It's beautiful. Um, 180 acre campus and, 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 and there's a lot of beauty that goes into it. But beauty doesn't change lives. Beauty mm. is shiny object that makes you say, I'll go take a look at this. Uh, and I think there's one KPI that I really dial in on that tells me like, you know, are we really moving the needle or are we not? Um, and that's AMA rate. And I'll get to that in a second. But specific to Sierra Tucson is we're really well built in so much that I have over 400 staff members here to see about 100 patients. So we run a four to one staff to patient ratio. And while that's amazing for the patient, the reality is that we meet two times a day in treatment teams. I have 25, I'm sorry, 22 medical doctors on full-time staff, about 50 some odd therapists, and then a bazillion nurses and everybody else to make the wheels go round. But two times a day, my treatment team meets, and two times a day, every patient is spoken about individually. How is so-and-so doing? How do they do with SE? How are they doing with CBT? How do they do with the DVD class? 
Maybe adventure therapy might be better. You know what? He had a great response to equine therapy. Let's put that in tomorrow's schedule. Hmm. So for any of you schedulers out there, this is going to be a nightmare and you're probably going to turn this <laughs> off so your boss doesn't listen to it. But every single day, the patient gets a unique schedule. Hmm. Every single day it's delivered to their bed. Here's where you go tomorrow. This class, this, I mean, process groups remain process groups. Your psych and your, you know, they remain permanent. But how you move around art therapy, equine therapy, CBT, DBT, all that stuff is predicated on how we see you move. We, I have a neurological team. I have eight members on my, my Sierra Tucson Research Institute team that do all the outcomes and do the EE genes and the brain mapping and the TMS. And we do the on-site ketamine program for holding space and the stellate ganglion blocks. We refer to our neighbor next door. Um, we have an entire VA program that what's all red, we call it red, white, and blue. And I love it because it really takes care of those people that take care of us. Mm -hmm. My daughter's a firefighter. And uh, so it's, it's very passionate for me. Um, for any of you guys that know that life, you have the stories. Hey, you can tell me this story, babe. But like when, when mom's on the phone, like let's just say it was a boring shift. Right. Uh, because mom's not want to need to hear those stories. But we have a program that is that is run by military veterans that is exclusive to them. Um, but you heard me talk a lot about chiropractic, and I'm wondering if somebody's saying, well, if you like it so much, why isn't it on campus? The reality is it is. I have multiple chiropractors on full-time staff, not contractors. I have multiple physical therapists. I have body work. I have massage. We have acupuncture. We have sound bath. And I have multiple naturopaths and dietitians, all to integrate and to, to your point, John, say, what works best for the patient is unique to that human being, mm. as, as unique as it is a fingerprint. And I know we all don't have the resource to say, well, if I could have everything from chiro to ortho to pain to psych to psychologist to specialist therapist to EMDR to, well, I could do it too. And the reality is you're 100% right. And I'm absolutely blessed and I'm fortunate that I happen to be sitting in this chair uh, and running this thing called CR2, which is a juggernaut. That, that has the ability to do that. So I, I wholeheartedly, you know, agree with, I guess, my own statement of it's not the norm. I get it. Um, but the thing that I'm the most proud of right now, and I think a, a KPI that is really telling when you're talking about what differentiates a program is when you hear from what the patients say. And I'm not talking about the reviews on Amazon. I'm not talking about the reviews on Yelp. I'm talking about your AMA rate. Are you exceeding, are you meeting or exceeding the patient's expectations? Well, we are at a 2.1% AMA that I track daily on about 140 patient census at any given time. And when you're at a 2% AMA rate, we know the people AMA in this industry, we know the type of patients that we have. In my belief, it's because we are meeting and or exceeding the expectation. So it's my belief that every morning a patient wakes up and makes that decision, is today's care worth the dollar value that I have to pay for this? And if it is, I'm going to stay. And if it isn't, I'm going to leave. And yes, there are more factors than that. But when, when my AMA rate is there, I know that my team is in coexistence with the needs of the patient and it all is working like this, right? And when, when the AMA rate jumps up, the problem is us. How do we fix it? So that that's Sierra Tucson in a nutshell. Um, we have about 180 beds. We have inpatients, you know, and we do the detox and the stabilization and the fragility. We're a co co occurring comorbidity um, treatment facility. Mood, trauma, and addiction. We're very heavy in the mood and trauma. Um, it's very important to us. We're very very built around mood and trauma and addiction. And we have the RTC space, uh, the residential care. And then we have affiliated uh, outpatients, PHP and IOP. I have one in here in Tucson, one in Scottsdale, Arizona, and one in South Lake, Texas. And they're all beautiful, and, and they look as if they came from here and just landed there. It's the same curriculum and path and treatment and program and, and all of the greatness that goes along with it. So that was my infomercial, man. How'd that yeah, go? Yeah, that was awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> Did I sell you, John? Yeah, I'm sold. <laughs> so, all right, buddy. Uh, okay, so I'm thinking of... of someone who might be listening to this and maybe they have uh, a loved one and maybe they're, they've gone down the addiction and they're addicted and, and maybe they've said, yeah, I want to get help. But where do we look? How do you even try to find a place for them? 
can you tell us a little bit about what what what's the if someone were thinking about getting help tell us a little bit about the background of somebody one of the patients like how does someone decide yes. this is a this, good fit well that's, that's an excellent question john uh and i appreciate that at when so you'll find all of our information the easiest place is cr2son.com all the phone numbers and the, the numbers and the, a tremendous amount of information and resource about the programs who what when where cr2son.com but every call with us starts with a phone call to what we call an admissions coordinator and those admissions coordinators are people that have been in the industry for quite some time and they understand what this is and what it isn't and what we do a good job of doing which as the business side of me I can't stand is we don't accept everybody because we think there are other programs out there that are better for some people than our program. And while I would like to say that everybody that calls, we, we take all comers. No, we have found that if we stay within what we're really good at, mm -hmm. for example, um, eating disorder, mm -hmm. right? I can take a level of eating disorder, but if that is your primary, there are much better facilities mm -hmm. for you. Like, and, and, and that's where you need to go. And so my staff very much takes that approach at what is best for the person comes first. It's kind of the Disneyland experience. I have my whole staff. You're going to laugh, but the BR guest, and, you know, <laughs> I love it. Everything is, is about, you know, reverse engineer. If you were the patient, how would you want it? And if I'm the patient or, and, or I'm sending my daughter mm -hmm. to care mm -hmm. and I'm going to spend a very large sum of money out of pocket, whatever it is, I want to know that. It all starts with trust and the trust starts with that. I made the phone call and that the program you have and the providers you have and the tracks that go along with what you understand about my daughter, that you truly believe that this is the best place for her to go. And that you would be honest with me and say, if there's a better place, Hey, there's a female teenage, mm -hmm. you know, you should go to Timberline Knowles. That's or you should go to the refuge or you should go to some of these other, you know, Betty Ford Hazleton or, mm -hmm. or summit programs or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, yeah, I get frustrated from a business side that we refer out quite a bit, but at the end of the day, we have to remember why we're doing the work And John, right. um, I think you and I both know there's much easier ways that are less, um, less of a gravity well on your soul than doing mm -hmm. this type of a work to make money. So you have to ask yourself, why are you doing it? It's, it's not, you're not in the, I want to get rich, right? right? You're in the. I get rich off spiritual satiety, meaning I see lives turn around. I get uh, phone calls mm -hmm. from parents. You gave me my, my, my daughter back. I get mm -hmm. spouses. You, you gave me my husband back. And, I, and that's, that, that passes through yeah. me. They send it to me. It goes to my team. I don't do any of that. Mm -hmm. But that fills my cup and it puts my head on the pillow every night. And I wake up and I feel like I have a small, very, very small touch mm -hmm. on trying to help people and um i measure wealth more in purpose than i do in right. commas and decimals yeah and, and i think my staff does too yeah and and that, that's what makes us different exactly and and that's something that you can't put a price tag on that's it's priceless so. i love it i love it <laughs> you use my name i just need to put less <laughs> right about there <laughs> next uh, time you have, podcast five i'll have priceless at my yeah that's right that's right yeah. uh, we can you know, we can do this all day long we got the prices right so yeah, yes, I, I, we, we, listen, I, I lived it for 51 years now. I've heard all of them, um, <laughs> half price, cut price, reduced price, you know, everything. Oh, so. that's great. That's great. Well, uh, I just want to thank you so much for just sharing just thank your you. story. I mean, your story, if, it seems to me your story embodies the whole, uh, what you're doing now as the CEO <laughs> of Sierra Tucson and, you know, you are, you are like the, a person who would, would have benefited from that. I'm sure Absolutely. And getting that type of treatment and it is specialized, but it's, it's also sounds very personal mm -hmm. and it's not, it doesn't sound clinicky at all, but you have the professional clinicians there. And uh, it really sounds like an environment where people can really flourish and heal 
and have that space to be able to be themselves and not have this. I have to be something or someone else. I can just be me and everybody there gets it. And that sounds amazing. Yeah. It's I I, look, I inherited a great team. I'm not um, a wizard to this. I inherited a great team. I came on a little over a year ago and uh, I'm surrounded by people that are just brighter than me and just are fantastic. Yeah. Well, we're, we're as good as our team is, right? So that's, that's awesome. Absolutely. Well, I want to uh, just mention and remind my listeners, they're going to have show notes. And so I know um, Derek has talked about the website and thing. It's going to be on the show notes. So don't worry about trying to figure out and remember the, the website, but it's on there. Uh, it's just go, go to Sierra Tuscan, is, to Tucson. And is it .com? Derek, is it? Yeah. Okay. That's pretty simple. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, Pretty simple. It's something that I do enjoy asking my guest is about self-care. And you talked a lot about um, mm-hmm. this about your whole history, but I'm also interested in, because I talk about it a lot, is self-care because it's so important to our overall health, not just mental health, but overall health. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do for your self-care? Sure. Um, it's well, I don't know if it's normal or abnormal. I, you know, John, I've never had anybody ask me that question this way. Um, I find meditation through physical activity, mm-hmm. and that allows me to turn my brain off to the noise, um, and that the position I'm in and the you know, the amount of plates that we all spin, uh, especially as a CEO, you have to find space, right? So there, there's two things that are very important to me. One is when I am at home, I am a father and I am a husband first and foremost and second to none. Mm. And I have about an hour commute to work that is intentional. Um, And then during that hour, I change uniforms. I go from being dad to I start my phone calls and I move into being the CEO. And then on the way home, I have found for me uh, and for my family and my wife, I've been married 30 years, you know, uh, to my best friend on planet Earth, Heather. Um, we met in 91. We're still married till today. Nice. Uh, three beautiful children. Um, on my drive home, I get to take off that CEO mindset of like, if you ask me a question, here's five answers and they're coming rapid pace because there's 100 people in line to ask me questions. And this is going to be a total shocker to all your listeners. But your spouse doesn't want you to always answer questions. Like that. <laughs> Sometimes they just want to say the question mm-hmm. and you just to listen. Mm-hmm. So for me, that was, it's a great opportunity to have that transition time. And then when I'm home, um, going to the gym, I go to the gym regularly, you know, five, six days a week. And I also roll a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Mm. I've been doing it for 20 plus years. I'm an instructor. Um, it's, it's my passion. And I find that when I'm in... I don't call it combat. I call it like physical chess. When I'm in physical chess with you, the only thing I can think of is that front sight focus is exactly what's in front of me. I'm not thinking about EBITDA contributions. I'm not thinking about ADC. I'm not thinking about my census. I'm not thinking about the bills, taxes, anything else. It's single focus. And if I get that single focus every day, it allows me to just, my wife calls it, you know, getting my wiggles out, stay calm, (laughs) very little things rattle me. I get excited about things that are exciting, but like stress comes my way. And I I try and keep my cup empty Mm -hmm. because, you know, people are like the smallest thing made him stress out. Well, it's because his cup was here and then one more ounce it spilled. Mm -hmm. So for me, that empties my cup. Physical exercise has always been, um, as you, from early on in my life, I, I, I grew a very positive relationship with it. But not an addictive relationship, not an OCD <laughs> relationship. Let me quantify a very positive and healthy right. relationship yeah. that uh, works for me. Ah, that's fantastic, and it's so important. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I, I know we could we could keep talking and going on and on. I mean, it's been a real pleasure getting to know you and talking to <laughs> you and, and hearing your story and, and where you come from and where you're at and where you're going to continue to go and. 
And so it's been great uh, to have you on. And I uh, just want to mention to my listeners, uh, if you've been listening for a long time, I do I really appreciate you. And and if you're new and maybe uh, you saw the name Derek Price, and said, oh, I want to see, you want to listen to this, then I really appreciate you uh, coming on. And, and I would just uh, encourage you to follow the Mental Health Today show. So uh, wherever you're at, if you're struggling with pain and mental health and you, you know what it's like, you know what Derek was talking about and, and what it's like to feel that way. And so whether you go to a, a chiropractor or you go to a mental health professional or both, uh, I want you to continue to work on that. And your health is your mental health and your mental health is your health. And I firmly believe that. So keep working on you. Keep listening and keep uh, studying what it means to be healthy and you're going to live a fulfilling life. Well, my friends, thank you so much. I'm going to let you go until next time. Take care of yourself and thanks for listening to the Mental Health Today show.